Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this event on peace building on the Korean Peninsula, US and uh, European perspectives, uh, an event jointly organized by the US Institute uh, of Peace and uh, the Brussels School of Governance, uh, its Center for Security, Diplomacy and Strategy, plus the Korea chair that belongs to the center. My name is Ramon Pacheco Pardo. I hold the KFBUB Korea chair and I will be your host uh, today. Um, before we begin, um, just to let you know that we're going to be uh, collecting uh, questions for the second half of the session today. So feel free to add them uh, in the uh, chat function and uh, the speakers will be answering them. For the first half, we're going to have uh, a discussion uh, among the speakers. Uh, I will start by introducing uh, our four uh, panelists today and then we'll move uh, straight uh, to the discussion. So, firstly, we have uh, Frank Ohm, who is a senior expert on North Korea at uh, USTIP. He used to work for uh, government, so from 2010 to 2017, he worked at the Department of Defense, uh, including as a special counsel to the Army General Council, uh, a special assistant to assistant secretary of defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, and also senior advisor on North Korea in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, previously, he used to work in the private sector as a corporate attorney, and he was a Fulbright Scholar in Jeju Island, of all places, <laughs> not a bad place, actually, to spend a year or two. Uh, then we have uh, with us in the panel uh, as well, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Tom Fee Kim, who is a senior researcher at the KFBB Korea Chair. He's also an assistant professor of international affairs at the Brussels School of Governance, and he uh, has a PhD uh, in political science from Ohio State University. He has uh, taught in, in the US, in Australia, and also in Germany before moving to, to Belgium, uh, and he's a specialist on uh, alliances. Uh, including with uh, his book, The Supply Side of Security, A Market Theory of Military Alliances. We also have uh, another of my colleagues, uh, Ms. Linde uh, Desmele, who is a PhD researcher at the KFBB uh, Korea Chair, also the Brussels School of, of Governance. Uh, she has a, a master's uh, in uh, European studies from Leuven University and from Seoul National University. And uh, our Belgian viewers might remember her. She was a commentator during the recent uh, US election, spending all night uh, explaining to uh, Belgian viewers uh, the victory from President Joe Biden. And last but certainly not least, we have Ambassador uh, Joseph June, uh, who is a senior advisor to the Asia program of the uh, US Institute of Peace, USIP. He's also a former US Special Representative for North Korea uh, policy. And uh, during his time, 33-year uh, diplomatic uh, service, uh, during his time with the U.S. Department of State, he also served as a U.S. Ambassador to Malaysia and also Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs between 2011 and 2013. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll go ahead with the first question, which is actually uh, for you, Ambassador uh, June. Uh, you had this role as former special representative for North Korea policy and also a long career as a diplomat. So you had had a, a front row view North Korea during the, this time. Uh, in your view, have there been any common threats across different administrations regarding the role that the U.S. could play in supporting peace building uh, in the Korean Peninsula? Well, thank you very much. I'm very delighted to be here. Uh, it's a very rare occasion that we have a exchange with our European uh, counterparts. Uh, so very happy to be here and thank you for including me. Uh, you know, this is a North Korean issue it has been festering for such long, long time. And as you noted, I've dealt with it for a while much too long for me to really you know, think about it. But there are really three items I wanted to point out where I do think Americans in general have been misguided. The first is the assessment. We have always had not quite the realistic assessment of North Korea. Let me give you a couple of examples. You know, One was happened in mid 90s, I was also working on Korea issues at that time. And this was the death of Kim Il-sung, 
when Kim Il-sung died, you know, Americans really thought that his successor, Kim Jong-il, would not survive. And that misapprehension lasted for a long time, despite real hardship North Korea went through in the second half of 90s. And I would say we made a similar mistake uh, when Kim Jong-un came to power. Uh, this was, what, early 2011? You know, we regarded him. We didn't know about him. You know, he was 26-year-old, you know, a little bit pudgy and with uh, not a very good haircut. And, uh, and so it was a, almost a caricature. And we make those mistakes, caricatures of what North Korea. That's the first one. Second one is the real politicization of, uh, of North Korea diplomacy in Washington, as well as you know, in the other second most important country, which is South Korea. In Washington, we've been having fights between hawks and engagers, between realists and between, uh, between ideologues. And you know, examples of those that policy has suffered you know, Joe Bol John Bolton is certainly one. Uh, and then it goes, the list goes on, you know, Paul Wolfowitz being the other, and then politicians like John Kyle uh, and so on. So that has made diplomacy very difficult. Politicization is even worse in South Korea where elections, electoral outcomes, who is in power completely depends on how you view uh, North Korea, and you see that division. You know, U.S. and South Korea must work together on this issue, and yet, yet you see the serious degradation of our engagement efforts because of politicization in South Korea as well as politicization in, in, in the U.S., and we've suffered from that. And the last one, and there are many I would point to, is for the negotiators. When I talk to North Koreans, there is such what I call a symmetry between you know, the overwhelming interests of North Koreans and for US uh, negotiators who, you know, North Korea is important, but it's not a matter of life and death struggle. So for North Koreans, they are desperate. They must do completely what is wanted by their bosses. There is zero element of open discussion, and that has really hampered our view of North Korea and what we can do. So we get stuck on what I call lowest possible equilibrium and very hard to move away from that. So I'm hoping that as we learn these lessons, and especially we learn the lesson, I believe, from the Biden administration, that we can take some of these and really move on where we, our policy and our assessment become more realistic. So why don't I stop there and then, uh, and then uh, uh, hear what others have to say. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. And, and you already mentioned the, the Biden administration. Of course, we have the, the policy review coming out in the, in the coming days. So we'll be discussing this uh, later in the, in, the, in the panel today. Uh, I, I want to move on to Mr. Raum, who, who spent, as I said, seven years at the Department of Defense working on issues related to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, can you tell us how you characterize the views of the U.S. military regarding its role in, in any potential uh, peace-building process in the Korean Peninsula? Uh, thanks, Ramon. And it's great to be working with you and the Brussels School of Governments. I wish we were there in person in Brussels rather than where I'm at right now, sort of a raining day in Virginia. Um, but, you know, let me first, uh, I have a few follow-up points to Ambassador Yoon first, and then I'll get to the question about the military role. Um, I agree 100% with everything that Joe said. Uh, one thing I would add is that, so one of the problems is that the U.S. for a very long time basically had no interest in peace building on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and instead, its primary focus was on uh, using deterrence and defense to maintain peace and prevent North Korean aggression. But uh, I think maintaining peace and, and basically the absence of violence isn't the same thing as peace building, right? A second issue was that the US also felt uh, that it was basically up to the two Koreas to reach a peace. 
Now, of course, I think that's true that two Koreas do need to work together to establish uh, peaceful coexistence. But I think this ignores the fact that North Korea has always viewed the U.S. as the bigger threat and, and the main source of its problems, whether it's you know, U.S. military capabilities or the U.S. role in global sanctions. When the U.S. finally did start engaging with North Korea at senior levels, this was in the early 1990s, it was to seek North Korea's denuclearization first, and then only after that it would address serious peace building. So ultimately, I think the U.S. has, you know, overall had a very passive and somewhat ambivalent approach to peace building on the Korean Peninsula uh, that focused more on deterrence uh, over peace building and its own interests rather than, you know, thinking about mutual interests. Now, getting to the the question about the military role, so the U.S. military's primary goal has been uh, to ensure that it's prepared and that it's ready to deter and, if necessary, defend against uh, any North Korean aggression. And this all stems from uh, the military's main objective of keeping the U.S. and its people safe, as well as our commitment to the, the U.S.-South Korea uh, Mutual Defense Treaty to protect the Korean people. So I think this perspective can be summarized as peace through deterrence. So our force presence on the Korean Peninsula, all our significant military capabilities uh, that we bring to bear from uh, both off and on the peninsula, our commitment to mutual defense, combined with South Korea's military capabilities, their the significant size, um, and our ability to train and prepare for uh, various contingency, all of this deters North Korean aggression. Um, and then it's this environment of stability and relatively low tensions that creates the opportunity in which our societies and our economies can flourish and prosper, uh, as the last 60 years have shown. Also, uh, deterrence creates the type of environment in which negotiations can take place and diplomacy can hopefully succeed as well. But I think there becomes a point where the military's presence and activities can raise tensions and impede trust and peace building. And I'm referring to what you know, people in, in, in the political science refer to as the security dilemma, right? Which is that you know, one state starts taking actions to improve its own security, but then these actions are viewed as threatening by another causing that state to improve its own security, which leads to a vicious cycle. So in the Korea context, you know, we had North Korea attack in South Korea that led to the Korean War. And then the U.S., South Korea, the U.N. responds with a force buildup. North Korea in turn uh, develops nuclear weapons and missiles. Then the U.S.-South Korea alliance introduces missile defense systems. North Korea builds bigger nuclear weapons that can reach the continental United States, and then so on and so forth, right? So the question is, how do we break uh, this cycle? How do we start a process of trust and confidence building so that we turn this vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle of tension reduction? I think one potential model would be for you know, one country to begin the process by taking unilateral conciliatory measures up front and then uh, ask the other side to reciprocate. We've seen successful examples of this type of approach even on the Korean Peninsula. I would point to the comprehensive peace plan that was proposed by South Korean President Moon starting in 2017, which led to the process of inter-Korean and U.S. DPR engagement in 2018. I would also note that this period of engagement included military confidence building measures, such as the suspension of U.S.-South Korea joint military exercises in August 2018, as well as the inter-Korean comprehensive military agreement that was agreed to in September 2018. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. And then we will have, I think, time probably uh, later on to discuss uh, the, this cooperation, obviously, with, 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 with South Korean initiatives that South Korea may have as well. But now I want to move to, to Europe, and I'm going to move to, to my colleague, Dr. Kim. Uh, what about the European Union? Uh, what has been Europe's approach towards North Korea in recent years, uh, and also especially in terms of supporting peace building uh, in the Korean Peninsula? 
Um, I'm going to be very simplistic and probably uh, offensive or rude to some people, um, but I believe that from the perspective of the European Union, the road to Pyongyang from Brussels should go through Washington, D.C. This is only natural because European states are geographically far from the Korean Peninsula, and they have relatively little economic and military interests at stake. European states have a very close tie with the United States, and frankly, the transatlantic relationship is so much more important than their relationship with the two Koreas. Obviously, this doesn't mean that the European Union's approach to North Korea will be identical with that of the United States, because the United States has a very different capability and also the, a different role as a geopolitical actor in East Asia. But it still does mean that the European Union will not spend their precious political capital to influence U.S. policy toward the Korean Peninsula. So what does it mean in terms of the actual EU policy toward North Korea? After the Clinton administration signed the agreed framework with North Korea in 1994, the EU policy was characterized by positive engagement with Pyongyang. Uh, Clinton asked the EU to join the Korean Peninsula Energy Development Organization, CATO, and the EU joined it as an executive board member in 1997. And the member states of the European Union actually at that point had already begun financial contribution to CATO even before the European Union joined the, um, the organization CATO. And, um, the European Union also financially contributed to the heavy fuel oil supplies to North Korea, about 20% of the cost. Um, EU DPRK, EU North Korea political dialogue began in 1998, and many Western European states, which didn't have a diplomatic relation with North Korea in the past, began to have such diplomatic ties around 2000 and 2001. And in 2001, uh, the Swedish Prime Minister uh, at the time visited Pyongyang in his capacity as the President of the Council of the European Union at the time, and the European Union established a diplomatic tie with North Korea. So and during this positive engagement phase, EU member states provided financial and technological assistance to North Korea, and European humanitarian organizations also began a lot of projects on the ground in North Korea. But with George W. Bush coming to the White House in 2001, the U.S. policy toward North Korea shifted to a more hawkish direction, and the EU policy toward North Korea also began to shift. After North Korea announced its uranium-based nuclear weapons program in 2002, many states stopped their aid to North Korea. And from around 2003, the EU's policy reduced its positive engagement element, and the EU also aligned its policy with the hardline policy of the United States. And now this approach is known as critical engagement. The United States hasn't gone back to the Clinton era engagement with North Korea after that, so it's not surprising that the European Union continues to have this more critical approach toward North Korea. And we should also keep in mind that North Korea's nuclear weapons program has advanced a lot. So the EU has more reason of its own to worry about the nuclear proliferation. And Trump's shift, President Trump's shift to a less confrontational policy toward Kim Jong-un didn't require the softening of the EU stance toward North Korea. So that's another reason why the EU stance still remains to be more critical uh, toward North Korea. Um, I guess I will stop here. Thank you, and, and it's interesting because uh, you, you mentioned the, the U.S. factor in EU policy, uh, and I think uh, the next question, uh, Mr. Smelly, I think I want to ask you uh, about this, actually. How, how do you think that the EU can play uh, a supporting role, uh, or what role can it play in actually supporting the, the U.S. policy uh, towards North Korea? Uh, yes, thank you. So good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think first to start, I really want to copy everything that was uh, said by Dr. Kim. I think that really provided some very much needed background for, for the discussion if we, if we, if we kind of shift the discussion uh, to today. 
And as was already mentioned, so the EU for, for several years followed the policy of critical engagement towards North Korea. And so in them answering the question, I do want to start by emphasizing that the critical engagement policy has three goals, and, and I will go back to why that's important in just a minute. So first, the EU uh, wants to uphold the international non-proliferation regime. Secondly, it wants to improve the human rights situation in North Korea, so the living conditions of ordinary North Koreans, if you will. And then it wants to thirdly support a lasting diminution of tensions on the Korean peninsula, which really links back to the, to the theme of today, more the peace building uh, theme, I guess. And so it's my impression um, that for many years the nuclear issue has really overshadowed any uh, discussions on human rights or, or reducing tensions. This was the case in the United States and it kind of trickled down also to European debates and of course at this nuclear issue is important. It's very important. Policymakers have very good reasons to be worried about this but I do think that somewhat of an unfortunate consequence of this preoccupation really with the nuclear issue is that sometimes in the European debate it seems that North Korea it's just all about nukes and while this non-proliferation aspect is one of three goals of the EU. It's a very important one, but it's one of three. And so I think that going forward, if we then think about the EU's agenda uh, on the Korean Peninsula and, and the prospect of transatlantic cooperation, perhaps, it's easy to think of a glass half empty. We, of course, have to be careful in speculating too much about the Biden administration, but it does seem unlikely, uh, to put it frank, that the Biden administration will all of a sudden manage to achieve what so many have tried and have not succeeded in, which is to achieve the complete uh, denuclearization of, of the Korean Peninsula. But I do think that despite uh, this, that in contrast to the Trump administration, the Biden administration does uh, really have, there's two important differences there that I do think might open up a window of opportunity for the United States and the EU to work together, uh, obviously in consultation with South Korea, when it comes to those other two goals, so human rights and then peace building. Because First, when it comes to the human rights issue, in contrast to the Trump administration, human rights and, and broader even democracy, it's really one of the main themes that the Biden administration is trying to, to, to profile itself on. And if it really wants to put its money where its mouth is, so to speak, it will also have to address that question in a North Korean context. And Vice President Kamala Harris has also already mentioned that she would actually consider targeted sanctions relief if that could improve the lives of, of ordinary North Koreans in exchange for some serious steps to roll back the nuclear program. But, but I do think, obviously, very difficult exercise, but I do think it is telling that Harris really speaks here about the lives of ordinary North Koreans. She doesn't speak about economic development or something in an abstract sense, but I do think her language kind of reveals some of her sensitivities and her priorities in this regard. And this is the case also for the US Department of State more broadly who have recently set out statements really showing their concern with uh, North Korea's network of political prisons, labor camps, use of forced labor, and so on. And so, of course, making any sort of sanctions relief a very targeted exercise, so really targeting those sectors that could improve the, the lives of ordinary North, North Koreans will be technically, politically all very important. But I do think that we have now, that we are now in a political climate where we can at least have this discussion and actually even without sanctions removal there is already some room uh, of maneuver for the EU to focus it's it's to, to really advance this human rights agenda if you will uh, because the EU could for example uh, increase its humanitarian assistance to North Korea therefore there's no sanctions removal uh, needed and if then partial sanctions relief would somehow be put on the table I do think that an obvious starting point there has to be anything that has to do with uh, food production um, and so on and I think that Europeans can play a supporting role there so not only governments but also NGOs on the ground that can help gathering information about the situation in North Korea and really distribute humanitarian um, assistance and get a good view of, of the needs. So with, with Biden in Washington, I do think that there is some room of maneuver there that perhaps wasn't there under a Trump administration. Of course, the other side of the equation, once you start talking about sanctions, the steps to roll back the North Korean nuclear program, 
there's, of course, as we all know, a profound lack of trust between the US and North Korea. But perhaps, and this has been mentioned before, Europeans could play a role here in any sort of a verification role. Uh, countries like France, which is a nuclear power, also have the necessary expertise to do so. So I do think the bottom line is that the political climate has changed and that there seems to be an opening to put human rights back on the table with or without um, sanctions relief. And then Secondly, I also think there's a shift with the Biden administration in really emphasizing on multilateral diplomacy, working with allies in its foreign policy. And there I do once again think there might be some, in, some increased room to work on some bottom-up confidence building measures in, in the Korean context. And once again, I think Europeans could play a role. They could organize host meetings as they have done in the past, but perhaps in a more structured, long-term, organized manner. And they can also start talking, I think, to uh, the North Koreans as the EU, as, as, as an actor, which is not the case at the moment. And, and I think any additional line of communication can then also perhaps be, be used to back channel between Pyongyang and Washington at times when there are certain political reasons not to do this uh, out in the open. And bringing the Europeans into the equation might also be appealing to North Korea, North Koreans are interested in European cash, but perhaps a bit less cynical, multilateralizing the process might also add credibility to it because as was mentioned by Ambassador Yoon, this is the, the North Korea issue is very often politicized in different contexts, in different political and different domestic contexts. And by multilateralizing, you might yeah, in, input some more stability there. So here as well, I do think that the political climate seems to be right for the EU to to start maneuvering a bit more without being afraid of immediate backlash and immediate retaliation uh, on the part of the United States. And perhaps to, to just wrap up, I also think it's important to emphasize that the United States is obviously a very powerful actor, but Biden, President Biden is also in a difficult political situation when it comes to North Korea, because on the one hand, he wants to underline differences with his predecessor by emphasizing human rights, by working with allies. But he also has an interest in making sure that he doesn't revert into an Obama era strategic patience approach. So which builds on the assumption that basically very harsh sanctions will just pressure uh, the North Koreans to come to the table eventually, which obviously didn't work uh, in the past. So I think that either the Biden administration can resort to the classic US playbook and confine the debates to a conversation about sanctions and nukes, to put it bluntly, or it can try to broaden its debates and, and, and prove in a sense that it really cares about human rights and peace on the Korean peninsula by looking at those issues partly, but not solely as a function of uh, any nuclear talks and, and progress. And I think that if the US really opens up somewhat some space for that, that, that the EU should really support that and even encourage that and, and can also show uh, that, it, that it is a player in East Asia, which, which the EU has been desperate to show for such a long time. But now it's perhaps um, it has the opportunity uh, to do so. And I think I, 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 will, uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it has been very interesting to hear more about uh, how how they could cooperate with uh, with the U.S. in, in a Korean Peninsula uh, context. Uh, a reminder to our audience that you can add your questions uh, to the chat function, and, and we'll be having a round of questions from the from the audience uh, in a bit. Uh, but first, we're going to discuss the U.S. ROK uh, relationship and alliance uh, in the context of Korean Peninsula peace building. Uh, Dr. Krim, I think I'm going to begin uh, with you. Uh, what role do you think that this alliance can play in, in peace building uh, in the Korean Peninsula, the alliance between uh, the ROK and the United States? Mm -hmm. um, as Mr. Aum earlier mentioned, historically, the US-South Korea alliance has played an important role in deterring North Korea from aggression. And South Korea's conventional military capabilities are now much superior to um, those of North Korea. But this deterrence element of the alliance still shouldn't be dismissed because North Korea possesses nuclear weapons and South Korea doesn't. So this narrative is very popular and, and also has merits. But when we look back at the origin of the US-South Korea alliance and more recent history, 
I say especially after the first North Korean nuclear crisis of 1993 to 1994, we also see another important role of the alliance in the Korean, Pen um, Korean Peninsula peace building. First of all, the 1953 mutual defense treaty between the United States and South Korea was signed initially more for the purpose of restraining South Korea than for the purpose of deterring North Korea. Um, the South Korean president at the time, uh, Lee Sung man was sabotaging the negotiations for the armistice. And Dwight Eisenhower accepted Lee's demand for a mutual defense treaty in exchange for Lee's cooperation to stop the Korean War. Alliances are typically understood as tools for fighting war or intimidate other states, but academic research on alliances has actually shown that military alliances also play an important role in restraining the members of alliances from taking risky or offensive actions. Starting with the 1993-1994 nuclear crisis, South Korea has had to worry about the possibility of a second Korean War initiated not by North Korea, but by the United States for the purpose of nuclear non-proliferation. Before then, the alliance dynamic had been mostly about South Korea worrying about being abandoned by the United States and the United States worrying about being entangled in a war to protect South Korea. But in a situation where the United States is no longer necessarily commit, committed to the status quo of the Korean Peninsula, um, and wants to reverse the nuclear weapons development of North Korea, South Korea has to worry about the risk of war initiated by the United States. When we think about South Korean government's policy toward the US ROK alliance, especially those of progressive presidents like No Mu Hyun and Moon Jae in, they try to um, please the United States, not just to avoid abandonment by the United States. They also make concessions to the United States so that they have voice in US policy toward North Korea and avoid South Korea's entanglement in a US war against North Korea. By the way, even in recent years, it has not been just South Korea restraining the United States from taking a risk, risky action. For example, uh, former US Secretary of Defense Robert Gates wrote in his memoir that uh, South Korean President Lee Myung-bak initially wanted to retaliate against North Korea's shelling of Yongpyong Island in 2010 in a disproportionately aggressive manner. But the US side restrained the president and the crisis was um, resolved in a in a much less uh, violent way. So the restraining works both ways. And in that sense, I would say that the US ROK alliance can continue to serve as an institutional mechanism where the United States and South Korea can restrain each other from taking a risky or offensive action. The US-South Korea alliance plays an important role in relation to other countries like China and Japan, but I think that discussion will be just too complicated and take too much time. So I just stop here for the moment. Thank you. Th th thanks to you, because uh, I mean, it's a very complex uh, topic, as you say, and you've been able to, to summarize it in a, in a few minutes. Uh, I want to carry on with this talk about US ROK cooperation, and I want to move to Ambassador June and the current US administration, because of course, uh, Ambassador June, you serve under Vice President Biden, when he was Vice President under President Obama, and, and you will know quite a few uh, of the people who have just recently joined his administration to deal with, with East Asia, with the Korean Peninsula. So, so with the new Biden administration promising, as we, as we have said, to work with allies, the recent visit by Secretary of State uh, Blinken and Secretary of Defense uh, Austin to, to Korea and, of course, to Japan as well. Uh, how do you think Washington should coordinate with Seoul in, in relation? Well, thank you very much. But I, Policy I, of the I, Moon government with that clearly is engagement. Thank you very much. I very much uh, I enjoyed and uh, I thought the comments of all the panelists were very, very relevant. Um, you know, there is a old Korean saying in to, to put your shirt on right, you got to get the first button right, you know, so that the shirt looks great. And so start is very, very important for the Biden administration. And I think they've made a good start. 
Uh, they have in, they have tried to engage with North Korea. It's now become clear that they have sent a back channel message number of times to North Koreans, but as of yet, North Korea has not engaged them. Uh, and they have made this very important trip to South Korea and Japan. They've met the Chinese in Alaska. And I think the next step should be that uh, Americans should tell North Koreans that they acknowledge the Singapore joint statement uh, that was made in 2018 between Trump and Kim Jong-un. I mean, there is nothing bad about uh, Singapore joint statement. I mean, it mentions complete denuclearization. It mentions peace process. It mentions building relations. There are some objections that the order of this is wrong, but I think you know, you and I can argue about whether the Ten Commandments have the order right. You know, uh, so so really, I think I think that if if the Americans were to do that, I am almost certain they will get a positive response from North Koreans. Realistically, there is no hope North Koreans going to denuclearize. I completely agree with Linda that you need to prioritize non-proliferation human rights, peace building, but I also think you need to prioritize absence of war. I think that's very important, you know, uh, to have a situation in which there is stable relations where you, it's predictable that there is not going to be a war in near future. And to do that, you need a process. So I would hope uh, the, the third step of uh, Biden administration would be to propose, whether it's multilateral format, bilateral format, to propose uh, a process that will get us to stabilization. I think, you know, over the next few years, that's the most we can hope for. Thank you. Thanks to you. And um, I want just one, one last question between what you said to Mr. Aum and then we already have questions from the audience coming in, so we can move to them. But Mr. Roma, uh, more broadly speaking, uh, in in this process where we have to discuss uh, peace building, denuclearization, human rights, how do you think they relate to each other? How much should uh, the Biden administration prioritize peace building in the Korean Peninsula, uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis these two other goals, denuclearization and, and the human rights situation of, of ordinary North Koreans? Well, that's a great question. I think um, right now, and I mentioned this earlier, I think that peace building plays a secondary role in Washington's approach, meaning that the U.S. is very passive and, and almost reactive about peace building. So for the U.S., peace is used as something that comes about as a result of denuclearization rather than being a driver of denuclearization. The U.S. view is so focused on what we want in terms of uh, denuclearization and human rights improvements that we mostly ignore or discount what North Korea has been uh, demanding uh, about its own concerns and uh, security. And we've seen this throughout our policy towards North Korea, where we always demand that North Korea take denuclearization steps first before we have any discussions about peace or normalization. And I think this is a problematic approach because it requires North Korea to assume greater risks and costs to its own security first before it starts to see any eventual benefits. And this simply is not a realistic path for North Korea to take. Um, really, it's the U.S. as the more powerful country that's in a better position to take greater risks for peace. So as I hinted at earlier, I think the U.S. approach needs to elevate peace building uh, as part of the strategy so that it's equal to the goals of denuclearization and security. And I think these goals go hand in hand uh, and are complementary. The Trump administration actually tried this approach somewhat. So President Trump signed the Singapore Declaration, as uh, Ambassador Yu referred to, and it listed you know, new U.S. DPRK relations, a lasting stable peace regime as some of the main goals, along with complete denuclearization. Uh, and the special representative for North Korea policy at the time, Steve Began, he also articulated this approach as well when he said that the U.S. would seek 
peace and denuclearization simultaneously and in parallel. The problem was that this approach wasn't implemented consistently by the Trump administration. You had Trump and Deegan on one hand uh, being the good cops, while on the other, Secretary Pompeo and John Bolton were the bad cops, you know, demanding that North Korea denuclearize completely or at least significantly before the U.S. would take any steps towards uh, peace. And so I think this was a very incoherent approach and North Korea uh, got frustrated. Uh, so I think instead of that sort of incoherent approach, uh, what I would recommend is a bold peace offensive by the United States. Um, and under this approach, we would preserve our strong deterrence posture. We would maintain denuclearization as a long-term goal, but we would also signal a comprehensive effort to strengthen relations and build peace with North Korea. And this announcement should also include, um, and I agree with Ambassador Yoon, a reaffirmation of the Singapore statement and some unilateral confidence building measures uh, up front, such as partial sanctions relief, a unilateral moratorium on US strategic asset deployments to the peninsula, an end to the travel ban to North Korea, and perhaps even a willingness to declare an end to the Korean War. Uh, also, I think, you know, recognizing that North Korea is not going to denuclearize in the short term or even the medium term, and that North Korea is de facto a nuclear power, we should be doing everything we can to maximize our engagement with North Korea. I'm not talking just about diplomatic engagement, but also military to military engagement, parliamentary engagement, academic and scientific exchanges, and humanitarian and people-to-people -people ties. And the point of all this, of maximizing engagement, would be to build mutual understanding and trust. Again, we're talking about two nuclear weapon countries here, to build their mutual understanding and trust and reduce any potential for miscalculation or miscommunication. And then one last point on uh, where human rights fits in. So I think you know, human rights has been tricky. Uh, past administrations have tended to try to separate the human rights issue from security negotiations because they feel like human rights could complicate or even delay progress on the security side. But it's becoming more and more important that human rights becomes integrated into the security discussion, uh, at least for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, the Biden administration has emphasized that it wants to speak to its values. The U.S. believes in human rights and how human rights advance the security for all. So from this moral perspective, we need to address our security, our, our, our human rights concerns uh, with North Korea. But I think human rights is also important from a very instrumental uh, political and legal perspective. So uh, the, there's a U.S. legislation, the North Korea Sanctions and Policy Enhancement Act of 2016, that specifically prohibits sanctions relief uh, unless North Korea makes progress on human rights. So that, from a legal standpoint, we'll have to overcome that if we're going to try to provide sanctions relief. I'm talking about unilateral U.S. sanctions. Uh, also, um, from a political perspective, uh, it's hard for U.S. politicians to get behind any eventual deal with North Korea unless there are some advancements on human rights. So I, I think we have to factor those in as well. The progress doesn't have to be all up front or you know, very significant right off the bat. It can start with small steps. So for example, North Korea could start taking meetings with uh, human rights officials like the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, North Korean human rights or the eventual US Special Envoy on human rights. I think that would be a good first step. Also, I think uh, North Korea has been known to uh, engage on some of the issues that were raised in the UN periodic review of North Korean human rights, like the rights of the disabled or the rights of, of children. So I think if you start with these low hanging fruit, that could be helpful. You know, later, if we want to achieve even bigger human rights advances, then I think we need to start thinking on the scale and scope of something like the Helsinki process. And I'm, I'm of course, have to raise that since we're talking about the Euro European perspective. But I think if we do something like that, then we really need to think about significant concessions on the US side because uh, as a much broader project where we'd be uh, embarking on. Uh, th thanks for that, and thanks for raising the Helsinki process. I think you have made many Europeans uh, happy on this side of the of, of the pond. Uh, I want I, I would add one one point actually that in my experience in dealing with 
North Koreans in 1.52 dialogues that they are willing to discuss human rights. Uh, as you were saying, sometimes it's the low hanging fruit, uh, obviously a very different understanding from what you will have in the US or we have in Europe, but they are willing to, to, to engage on, on, on this matter. I just wanted to add this a small point uh, before we move to the, to the questions from the audience. And uh, I think I'm going to start with an EU question since uh, US finished with, with the EU uh, and the Helsinki process. Uh, Mr. Smena, there is this question coming in, a very poignant question, actually. How can we restore engagement in the EU's North Korea policy uh, when there are virtually no European diplomats uh, in Pyongyang? Uh, probably right now there is no European diplomat, uh, except for Russians, uh, in Pyongyang. And also the, the DPRK government rejects even humanitarian aid. So how can we restore engagement under these conditions? Yes, um, thank you very much for, for this question, which, in the, which indeed is a very pertinent one. Um, perhaps in answering this question, it makes sense to indeed um, take a step back. And I would like to refer to what was being said by Mr. Om about what is the purpose of engagement in the end. And, and by in, what do we try to achieve through engagement? It's, as, as was said, we try to improve mutual understanding. We try to improve communication to prevent any misunderstandings that could lead to, to things spiraling out of control and, and so on and so forth. So I think if we define engagement in, in such a broad sense that you can do that on a state diplomatic level, but you could also do that perhaps politically easier on a non-diplomatic uh, on a non-diplomatic level so i think here um by um really encouraging ngos also to to to, to remain there and perhaps uh, i mean the eu uh, is in general very proud of all its educational exchanges that it organizes um, and perhaps to, to really open up more opportunities for, for indeed um, exchanges between universities, think tanks, NGOs and so on that, that can really at least um, also help because this, 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 this risk of caricaturizing uh, North Korea definitely also exists in Europe so that could already be, 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 be one step and then perhaps at a more state uh, diplomatic uh, level, I am personally a, a proponent of, of opening an, an, an EU uh, an EU uh, embassy or, or representation in Pyongyang. Um, Counter arguments that are often made against this is that on the one hand, it would be somewhat of a prize for North Korea because it also wants this and it wants to be recognized on the international scene. But quite frankly, in the last couple of years, we've seen summits between North Korea and the United States, North Korea and South Korea, China, Russia. I mean, I don't think it is realistic to still say that they are super isolated. So I don't think that uh, that this argument still holds, although I realize that this is a controversial statement to make. Um, and then secondly, another counter argument and which is related is that, well, North Korea, because of its human rights violations and so on and so forth, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't approve that. And, and, and this is also an argument made by countries like France, for that reason, we don't want to have a delegation there. But quite frankly, the EU does have delegations in countries that don't do per particularly well when it comes to human rights. I'm thinking about a Saudi Arabia. I'm thinking about a, perhaps a Sudan. And there they have these delegations. So I do think there's kind of a different standard being applied to North Korea. So my proposal would really um, to, to increase uh, communication through a delegation there because it is unclear to me to what extent communicating with your counterpart offers any sort of substantial concession as we have uh, arrived in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where, where Kim Jong-un has been traveling around to Singapore, has been traveling around uh, to Hanoi uh, and so on uh, and so forth. But I don't know whether there would be much political support for this proposal, quite frankly, uh, but I'm going to put it out there uh, anyways. Thanks a lot. Um, we have another question about human rights, but with a twist. And I want to ask Ambassador June about this. Uh, uh, um, a member of the audience is asking uh, whether there are any examples uh, of previous uh, times when prioritizing a focus on human rights abuses had led to positive outcomes and productive engagement with North Korea. So, Ambassador June, if you want to take this question. Thank you very much. Uh, one example I can think about is what Koizumi, the Japanese prime minister, uh, in I think 2000 or, or thereabout, 2001, 
negotiated with uh, Kim Jong-il in North Korea to get a uh, accounting of Japanese who have been abducted. And so at that time, there was good negotiations uh, initially, and a number of abductees actually came back to Japan, uh, and, and some remains came back. However, North Korea was never able to do a full accounting. And, uh, and, and so that, that and, 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 and the remains that they sent back were found to be not the remains of the Japanese citizens who have been abducted. So that issue became uh, even more inflamed issue, I would say, afterwards. So that's an example. I mean, I myself went to Pyongyang to, to get Autowambia, but then he died soon after coming to US. So initially feel good, but then it backfired on us as well. So, so human rights, protecting uh, citizens uh, is a long story. I would say there has not been much success of trying to make lives better for North Koreans uh, who are in prison and so on. So that's a tall order. It's a tall order even to get your citizens genuinely accounted for. So it is a very difficult negotiation. Thank you. But thanks for pointing to these examples as, as well, so we can learn from 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 past experience, um, Mr. Om. I want to focus now on the role of Congress because we have uh, three questions actually asking about Congress. I'm going to bundle them uh, together if you can tackle them. Yeah. Uh, one of them is. Uh, what what are the foundations uh, of DPRK that Congress must keep in mind when crafting U.S. policy on North Korea? Uh, things that Congress might not have appreciated uh, about the foundations of, the, of North Korea. Uh, a second related question is whether U.S. Congress can reach bipartisan consensus on a long-term policy towards the Korean Peninsula, um, uh, similar to the commitment uh, against foreign terrorism attacks on, on the U.S. homeland. Uh, and the third question related to Congress as well is uh, how can the U.S. government handle congressional impatience on the North Korean uh, issue? So, so if you can tackle essentially the role of Congress in, in, in dealing with, with North Korea. Yeah, that's a lot of questions there. I hope I can address even one of them. I think in general, um, I feel like, you know, Congress has the oversight role. And so to the extent that the executive branch can always maintain good communications uh, about its North Korea policy. So for example, you know, what the status of the policy review is, what the executive branch is thinking, um, that will help to have, uh, to enlist Congress as a supporter uh, rather than an obstacle in the, our overall North Korea approach. I think uh, when Congress feels like it's left out or it's in the dark about what the executive branch is doing, then it tries to take matters into its own hands, uh, including things like, you know, various legislation. Like that's what Congress does. They legislate, right? They try to constrain the, the, the executive branch. And instead of that, we should try to uh, ensure that Congress uh, supports what the White House is doing, right? I think in general, there's been a, a strong focus on sanctions recently. And so we've seen that with various legislations over the last decade that uh, enhances the government's power to enforce uh, uh, sanctions or even mandate sanctions on North Korea. Um, that can be restricting, right? Because if, if, you're, if the White House's hands are tied and it doesn't have the flexibility to engage in this policy because of legislation, then that can be problematic in terms of reaching a deal. Not only that, I think you know pressure has uh, shown to be ineffective as a policy approach over the last, not just last 10 years, but over the last 70 years, right? North Korea does not respond well to pressure. Uh, in fact, the, we've seen that they have uh, uh, implemented lockdowns uh, on its borders, and that's had 
that's had more of an impact than, than any international sanctions policy has against North Korea. So um, I think uh, we need to be more realistic about what has been effective in bringing North Korea to the table. When we engage with North Korea, as we did in the 90s, we've achieved uh, many uh, successes, including shutting down Yongbyon for eight years. Uh, and preventing North Korea from reprocessing its plutonium. According to some estimates, that saved us from potentially uh, seeing you know, uh, North Korea developing 100 nuclear weapons during that eight-year period from 94 to 2002. Conversely, that period from 2012 to 2018, uh, when we did not engage with North Korea, there was the longest period of non-engagement with North Korea over the last 30 years. It was also when we applied pressure against North Korea. That's when we saw the greatest advances in North Korea's nuclear weapons of, uh, capabilities. Four nuclear tests of progressively greater yields, over 90 ballistic missile tests, including at an intercontinental range. I think the empirical evidence is clear about what works with North Korea and what doesn't. Thanks for that. And, and I mean, it's interesting because we don't appreciate this from outside the U.S., how important Congress is in, in U.S. foreign policy decisions, including policy uh, towards North Korea. So it's always something to, uh, to consider. Uh, we have a question about another crucial actor, South Korea, that uh, I would want you, Dr. Kim, to, to answer. There is a question uh, asking, what would be the impact of the further development of South Korea's conventional deterrence capabilities on the peace building process in the Korean Peninsula? Um, I guess I haven't really thought about this to form a strong opinion about it, but I think it depends on what kind of capabilities we are talking about. For example, if it is deterrence by punishment, and if you, for example, want to increase the South Korean uh, capability to really punish the North Korean regime, and I guess its, it's extreme form is to be able to execute a yeah, um, attack against the supreme leader. And when you have that kind of thing, it could actually destabilize the strategic uh, situation on the Korean Peninsula. But if it is, for example, a deterrence capabilities that are more based on, for example, deterrence by denial, and if it is a capability to mitigate the damage North Korea can do, for example, um, to the Seoul metropolitan area in case of a military conflict, then that kind of deterrence capabilities could further um, contribute to the stabilization of the um, strategic dynamics. So depending on the capability, specific capability we are talking about, I think the, whether or not this would be harmful or conducive to peace would be different. Uh, thank you. And uh, I should tell our audience that we're going to go a little bit uh, over time uh, since we have uh, uh, a few more questions to, to tackle. Uh, the first of them, I think, uh, Mr. Smell, I want to ask you about it. Uh, will North Korea accept UN-based international observers or inspectors ever again? What are your views on this? Um, well, you always have to be very careful in speculating about what uh, Kim Jong-un will basically decide. But um, I think it, that depends on what uh, the DPRK thinks it can get in exchange, right? For allowing UN inspectors into North Korea or prohibiting them from entering, it's all part of, of, this, of this negotiation game or of, with bargaining game, if you will, where, where North Korea tries to get as much leverage as possible. So I do think when, uh, if, I should say if, instead of when, we shift to a more in, uh, engagement uh, type of atmosphere again, uh, and if perhaps there are certain implicit carrots offered to North Korea for accepting those, then I don't see any reason uh, why uh, they wouldn't do that again. Of course, they will be very picky on what precisely they show um, and where these people can go and not. But um, I think that's all part of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a longer cycle of a bargaining game uh, that, that's ongoing between North Korea and, to a large extent, in this case, uh, the United States. 
and, and of course that touches on, on Europe as well, right? Because we have French 3D inspectors that have already said they, they could be yeah. deployed if necessary. Exactly. There are also other, I mean, going through the UN has, has a more inclusive uh, touch to it. So it's probably also good for the legitimacy of, of, of the institution as such. However, even if UN-based international observers are not allowed in, there are there are other alternatives possible and there are indeed several European countries who have already mentioned their interest or willingness in, in, playing, uh, in playing that role. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. We move to Mr. Ram now with a question about the role that folks uh, not in government can play to support peace. So it's a question about uh, uh, NGOs, organizations such as uh, Women Cross DMC, DMC sorry, uh, these type of organizations that want to bring attention uh, to uh, the fact that many Korean people actually want to achieve peace. So, so what role do these organizations or can these organizations play uh, when it comes to supporting peace in the Korean Peninsula? Thank you. I think that's an excellent question. I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to answer from the perspective of the U.S. Although you know, obviously, there's roles to be played by you know grassroots uh, uh, citizens across the world. But I think um, so. These organizations like Women Cross DMZ, uh, other humanitarian uh, and, uh, grassroots organizations, human rights. Uh, those that focus on remains recovery of U.S. service members uh, that are unaccounted for from the Korean War, they all can play a helpful role. And it all starts with the ability of U.S. citizens and, uh, and their right to petition their government, right? Everyone has a right to ask their government for something that they want uh, changed about U.S. policy. Uh, we in D.C. tend to be caught in our groupthink in our bubble, um, but not recognizing or underestimating the ability of each U.S. citizen to advocate and lobby for changes in U.S. policy, right? And we've seen that. Um, I think uh, groups like Women Cross DMZ were very effective in advocating for uh, a declaration to end the Korean War. This was a House Resolution, uh, House Resolution 152 in the last session of Congress. It got 50 co-sponsors, uh, and it was bipartisan. I think there was, may have been one Republican co-sponsor as well. But that is uh, one sort of tangible step that these organizations can do lobby their representatives for a change in government, not just in Congress, but also in the executive branch as well. Another step I think would be very helpful is uh, to have a better understanding of what the North people, uh, what, what the, U the US people want, right? It's really unclear what, uh, how Americans think about peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, I've seen some surveys, but they're, they're kind of worded in ways that's not helpful. But to the extent that uh, there would be better, uh, more accurate surveys about the US uh, uh, people's thinking on peace, on ending the Korean War, on changing our approach to North Korea, I think that would be very effective in trying to persuade the government about what the American people actually want. Uh, th thanks for that. And, and, and of course, yeah, many European NGOs uh before COVID uh, were in North Korea, for, for example, right? So, so they can also play a role, as you were saying, different groups can play different, different roles, absolutely. Um, we have one last question that I want to ask uh, Ambassador Jun to, to answer. Uh, the question is uh, that there is a fundamental challenge, uh, which is that North Korea is not likely to denuclearize, but the U.S. is also not likely to recognize North Korea as a nuclear power, so as a nuclear state. So are there any ways to get around this uh, challenge to peace building in the Korean Peninsula? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And I would say yes. And, and that's uh, simply put, that's what diplomacy is about, uh, you know, making sure that what appears to be contradictions uh, can be can come together. Of course, we don't recognize Pakistan as a nuclear power. We, you know, so it's not as though this is a unique situation. And and but it is completely correct. They're not going to denuclearize. We're not going to recognize them as a nuclear weapons power. I think what the discussion has shown today to me is that United States needs to really broaden its policy aperture. We need to think about 
broader options, more options than just pressure. And that's the point that Frank has repeatedly made. And that is our traditional policy has been to say, Kim Jong-un must know that he's better off without nuclear weapons than with nuclear weapons. That doesn't work because Kim Jong-un will not believe that. His most highest priority goal is regime survival. And he thinks he's way better off with nuclear weapons than without. So by broadening the discussion with them, including peace and security discussions, as well as non-proliferation discussions, we are coming to really beginning to think about what is it that Kim Jong-un wants. So this is a challenge that's been with us. We failed at it so many times. And now, you know, we have different people coming in, but they are kind of similar, but they have learned their lessons. I worked very closely with Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan uh, during the Obama era. I also was also worked in Trump era. So they are coming in with significant lessons learned. And I do believe that there is loud voice, both in Europe and Asia, saying that you've got to think differently. Think about peace building as well as denuclearization. So I think this idea that we're all pressing for, that it's got to be more than one track. Let's hope we get some traction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for finishing with those uh, hopeful words, actually. So uh, I just want to thank Yusip for partnering with us, the Korea Chair uh, and the Brussels School of Governance, and for hosting this event. Uh, as uh, Mr. Aung said, hopefully next time in, in Brussels, uh, in, in Washington, or in, in Jeju Island. Uh, why not in Jeju that we could go there and <laughs> repeat this event? And thanks to the audience for being with us. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed, learned a lot, and I hope the audience also enjoyed the event. Thank you very much.